I'm just going to say hello, everybody. Welcome, and thank you very much for coming to this talk on understanding conflict. My name is Kira, and some of you may know me already from Inner Source Commons. So I got involved in Inner Source Commons back in 2021, at the beginning of 2021, and I'd never been involved with the virtual community before. And what a great community to actually be involved in. Uh, there's really engaged people. I find it to be a very positive, supportive community. And I've really loved working with some people um, here in the Commons to try and grow and support that community, whether it's through communicating with people on Slack or helping people out with the newsletter or social media or anything we can do to promote or celebrate the members. Um, I also have another life. I am a mediator. So I have my own company called Reset RP and I do a few different things under this. So I'm a mediator where I help people who are in conflict with each other. I also do conflict coaching. So that's where I work with somebody when they're um, experiencing a, 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 a conflict and they want one-to-one -one support. I'm a restorative practitioner. And just to dwell on this for a moment, restorative practitioner pr practitionering is really about relationship management and the building of positive relationships and group settings. OK, and there's different ways and approaches that I'll be talking about here throughout throughout our uh, talk today. And I'm also a facilitator. So I would work a bit with organizations who are going through difficult times or need to have difficult conversations. And I would support them around how they want to communicate that to people, but also how they want to be with each other while they're going through a transition or change. So here's a short outline of what we're going to do. Basically, I'm gonna have a real deep dive first into conflict. I really wanna talk you through what conflict means how it affects us. And then we're going to talk about it in, in terms of a work environment or an inner source environment, and maybe tips and things we can do to change our approaches, to make it better when we are trying to promote inner source and inner source ways of working in an organization. So I have a question first for people actually. So before I give a talk, I like to listen. So I'm going to ask everybody to type in the chat box now and remember, your answer won't be seen. I'm going to ask you the following. What is your energy level today between one and 10? So if your energy level is a one, that means you wish you were still in bed. If your energy level is a 10, it means you could climb a mountain or run a marathon right now. So it'd be fantastic if people could just now um, type in their answers and tell me how they're doing today. So I'm getting some answers here. Okay, so it's a little bit up and down. There's some really high ones. And then we've got... um. A few lower ones in the fours or whatever so i'm going to do my very best to keep that positive energy going and if you're feeling a little bit lower and a little bit tired today hopefully you'll be a bit more energetic at the end of this talk okay so we're now going to go into a definition of conflict and believe me there are tons of definitions out there but i want to make it as simple and as easy um, for everybody who's part of this call okay so in terms of organizational con conflict or conflict around when you're trying to promote culture change. I thought these two definitions were definitely the most simplest and maybe the ones that apply the most. The first one is opposition between two or more parties. So that's pretty straightforward. OK, we're having a clash and there's more than one of us involved. The next kind of complementary definition I would use is a natural disagreement. So that's when we're having a disagreement about our belief systems, our values, our needs or our ideas. OK. And then I'd like to talk a little bit about dysfunctional conflict, because often when we're thinking of conflict, we think of what it feels like or what healthy, unhealthy conflict really is okay so when conflict is dysfunctional or unhealthy it will have certain types of characteristics so one of the first ones is going to be tension okay that can be intellectual tension as you're grappling over deciding how to do something it can be emotional tension that you're feeling when another person walks a room walks into the room um the next thing can also be that you feel really stuck so often when we have a healthy conflict or a dysfunctional conflict, we will feel stuck. We haven't found a solution yet. And the solution doesn't seem to be that clear. Also, we may feel that we have found the solution, 
And the problem is the other person because they don't want to take on our great idea. The next thing is behavior, okay? We definitely know a conflict is unhealthy or dysfunctional when the behavior becomes unacceptable. Um, this also depends on where you're from, your culture and the family system you were brought up in. So I have a friend who is really comfortable shouting. Um, her whole family are, they shout at each other. They get it all out of their system and then they're fine. I didn't come from a family like that. So I wouldn't be comfortable with that behavior. But other people are really, really uncomfortable with being ignored. OK, so my behavior might be fine for me. It mightn't be for you. But either way, the behavior is causing a problem for one of us or for both of us. And then the last thing that we always feel when we're having dysfunctional conflict is it's personal. OK, this stops becoming about an idea or a need that isn't met. It's about you and me now and we have a problem with each other. OK, so why do we have conflict? Really, there's three main broad reasons why we have interpersonal conflict, right? Conflict between me and conflict between you. The first one is about values, OK? Every one of us are born with a set, set of values and we all broadly have the same same ones, no matter what culture you're in, OK? So we all want to be respected. We all want to be cherished. We all want to feel connected and loved. We all want to be treated with honesty. Um, we want to be able to trust people. So if those values become challenged in some way, that's going to cause a problem for us. OK, so if honesty is super important to me and I find out you've lied to a colleague about me, well, that's really going to cause a problem for me and for you. OK, and then there's also the values that we have in the communities we're in, whether it's your work community, whether it's your home whether it's in your neighborhood, they'll all have slightly different values depending on what their goals are. Then we have our needs, okay? So there's a picture there of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Our base need, our very first need that we all need is to survive. So we need air, we need water, we need certain physical needs to be met. After that, it's safety. And we're gonna talk a bit more about the theme of safety throughout this um, talk. But safety, whether it's physical safety or psychological safety or emotional safety, is really, really important. We also need to be loved. And we then we need to have connection. And then we need to have self-esteem, confidence. And when we get to the top of this needs pyramid, we want to be self-actualized, which means we want to become the person who can fulfill the potential that we have within us. If any of those needs get taken away or challenged or they're not met, that can also lead to conflict, okay? And it can be as simple as coming home from work and being tired and needing help and not get it, okay? The next thing then is our identity. Our identity is crucial to us. Many of us like to think we don't have big egos, um, and I'm sure many of us at this talk don't. But what I would say about identity is, these are the beliefs that we have about ourselves that are really core to ourselves. So they could be, I'm a good parent, I'm a great friend, I'm a wonderful colleague, I'm always honest. They're those core beliefs that we have. And if we find they've been undermined in some way, it could be through gossip, it could be through someone back channeling at work and saying you didn't do something properly when you know you did, that will lead to conflict because it will cause a lot of stress for you and the person who you know did that to you. Okay. So this slide is just about the other factors that impact on the type of conflict we have. OK, when I mean what I mean by that is the intensity or the scale of conflict. Now, there's many, many more factors than this, but I wanted to talk about the big ones, the big five or six ones we have. OK, so the first one is our own personal experience. What's our experience of conflict? OK. What messages have we told ourselves or have our family told ourselves, told us growing up about conflict? One conflict message we, we have that we might have inherited from our family is don't rock the boat. OK, if there's a problem, don't say anything. You're going to get into trouble. OK, so often when I'm doing conflict coaching with people, it's about figuring out what those messages that they have um, already about conflict 
what they are and how that's impacting them when they're working, when they have a conflict with somebody. The next thing is what caused the conflict, okay? Is this a disagreement or is harm at the center of this conflict? Have you been harmed in some way or violated? That's going to lead to a very different type of conflict. Also competition, okay? We can have conflict in highly competitive environments. OK, sometimes that's really good because it forces us to do better. It forces us to improve what we're doing. What I would say, though, is it will lead to conflict in some cases. And then what's the level of risk? What are the stakes that are involved when you have conflict? OK, if you're in competition with someone and the stakes are low, the conflict will be lower. There may be no conflict at all. But if you're fighting for resources that you really, really need, if you're fighting for your job or for your team, then the stakes are going to be high and it's likely you're going to get into more conflict situations. And then there's the relationship we have with the people we may be in conflict with. OK, the more connected you are to a group of people, um, the more you respect them, the more you have shared values, the more likely it is that your conflict will be minimal. OK, the more disconnected we are, the more likely we are to have conflict and it's likely to be greater in scale and more intense. And then I really want us to think about the system or the culture we're in. OK, you may have your own values, needs and identity, but we all none of us are islands okay we all operate work and live in different cultures and different systems our home system or culture that dynamic may be very different to our work culture but each of those cultures have a story and they have a value that they hold on certain behaviors or how we speak to each other how we relate to each other and where we want to be if you're in conflict in some way with the wider organizational culture you're in or the wider system you're in, that's going to bring up problems around where you fit or belong in that system. And also there can be huge clashes between different cultures around values, needs, or what we mean by identity. Okay, so we're going to start moving and looking at, at other types of um, conflict now but I want to ask you guys another question and once again it's in the zoom chat nobody has to um be spoken about here okay so this is my question for you when was the last time you saw a conflict or heard about a conflict and it's a multiple choice option okay is it in the last day the last week the last month the last year so you don't have to tell me what the conflict was about who was involved, whether you participated in it or not. This is just a chance to give you a sense um, about timescales and conflict, okay? So I'm just gonna model this by starting off. The last time I saw a conflict was this morning at about half seven in the morning when I was trying to get my kids out to school, okay? I'm not gonna lie, I kind of participated in this conflict by the end of it. I probably didn't use the best mediator skills I had, I'm going to be honest. So I'm just going to check out um, the, the answers here. OK. So a few of you have answered and we're getting the last week mostly. OK, one person so far has said the last day. Yeah. So what are we learning from this? We're learning that conflict is everywhere. And conflict is a natural part of life. We don't like conflict because of how it makes it feel, but it is possible to have healthy and functional conflict, okay? Conflict is about tension release, okay? If we're not getting our needs met, if there's a problem with the clash of values, um, that we're gonna feel tension. OK, and conflict is about releasing that tension. Conflict is about moving through a state where things aren't working and you're stuck and releasing that. So conflict is actually quite dynamic. Um, conflict is about pushing you to ask for your needs to be met. OK, or pushing or challenging a group to change its values so that more people with more diversity or differences can be included or more new solutions can be found. OK. Conflict is also about restoring equilibrium after there's been a change, okay? 
So if we think about changes that haven't been in our control and maybe the conflicts that have arisen from them, either at work or at home, sometimes we need to air these things, talk about these things, have disagreements about them, and then return to a new equilibrium or a new normal. So what I would say, and I would ask everybody to think about, is sometimes conflict is really positive. It's either a signal that something needs to change in terms of our values, our needs, our identity, or how we relate to each other. And if it's not a signal for change, it means change may have occurred and we're still trying to figure out how to deal with it. Okay, so I wanna talk a little bit about how conflict affects us. Okay, this theory comes from Dan Siegel, the de of the, who wrote The Developing Mind, and it's about the window of tolerance. So right in the middle of this picture, we have a lovely little unicorn that's floating along. I like to imagine it's like in a beautiful river in the countryside and the sun is shining and we're like that unicorn on a good day. Okay, on a good day, our window of tolerance, that little beautiful stream or river that we're floating down, is a pretty good place to be. We can even manage a certain amount of stress in our window of tolerance when we're having a good day or things are going well for us in our life. OK, stress becomes an opportunity to solve a problem. Stress becomes an opportunity to work harder. But basically, when we have stress and it becomes too much for us, we become what's called dysregulated and our little window becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. Our window of tolerance shrinks and we either become hyper aroused, where we go, become super vigilant, or we become hypo aroused. Okay, hypo arousal is when we almost become numb. We almost stop and freeze, okay? Why am I talking about this? Well, we've talked about conflict and change, okay? Human beings don't feel safe when there's change. Human beings don't feel safe when there's conflict. It causes a lot of stress for us, okay? So that's why it's really important to think about the window of tolerance here. And one thing I'd also like to mention here is this comes from a lot of work that's been done on neuroscience and trauma. So if you're going through a very difficult personal time or you've been subjected to trauma in your life, well, basically, your window of tolerance is going to be smaller and you have to work harder than other people to try and make sure you don't get into a dysregulated state so quickly. So what does this mean when we become hyper aroused or hypo aroused? Well, we go into fight, flight or freeze. So fight or flight or when we're hyper aroused, we're totally vigilant and we're going to fight this or we're going to run as fast as we can away from the problem and avoid it in any way we can, okay? Freeze is hypo arousal. That's when we become numb. That's when we really feel so flooded we can't really think properly. So if you've ever walked away from an argument or a disagreement and about an hour later went, oh, why didn't I say X? Sure, I knew about Y. If I'd said Z, this wouldn't have been a problem. Well, that's probably because you froze during that disagreement or that conflict. And then I also want to talk about fawn, okay? So fight, flight, freeze, and fawn, these are all automatic neurological responses that they're just the way our brains are all wired. And they're also based on our own experiences of life. So if you've ever been talking to somebody at work who's been super positive about what you're doing, if you're introducing something new, really engaged, really seems to be happy to do take on all the things you're asking them and then they disappear it could be that basically they're fawning so they're in a people pleasing mode because maybe there's someone who when they've been challenged before or had to engage in conflict before or been traumatized before they've tried fighting and it didn't work they've tried flight and it didn't work so they fawn now they say whatever they think the other person wants to hear and then they get out of dodge as quickly as possible. And one thing I just really want to say again, I know I've said it already, is these are automatic responses, okay? We don't think about them. They just kick in when we feel really, really threatened. And, you know, we're not running away from tigers in the jungle or anything like that, but 
we do feel threatened at times at work. We do feel very threatened by culture change. Okay, so the, these are very normal and natural responses in the workplace too. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about conflict in the work environment. Um, I want to go back to the old school work environment, okay? I want to go back a couple of millennia here where we're talking about maybe hunter-gatherer tribes, um, early civilization. In these cases, back in the day, there could be up to maybe 150 people max in a tribe, a village, or a clan. They were highly interdependent. So they lived together, they worked together, and everybody had a clear role in that group. So there were the people who hunted, the people who gathered, the people who prepared the food, the people who helped with somebody when they were sick, the people who looked after the babies, the people who gardened and grew, and the people who kept you safe if there was danger from outside okay because people were living and working together people knew each other very very well they had very enmeshed relationships i'm not saying they were perfect relationships or these were really happy communities but there were very very deep connections there and there had to be very very deep trust okay trust is really important people lived in these tribes or clans or villages their whole lives they didn't move out of them okay the way you you had to deal with conflict was very, very different. So you might get cast out of the tribe or clan if it was really, really bad. But if people needed you and you were really important to that tribe's survival, well, then people had to find a way to make it work, okay? Post-conflict, post-harm. And there are whole rituals around that um, going back to lots of indigenous communities, even to the Celtic laws. So I want to move a bit forward now and I want to ask you guys about the work environment you're in these days okay so another question for the chat how many people work in your organization so this is going to be an interesting one because I know quite a few of the people here and I know there's wow okay one is really big I didn't realize one was that big so we've got one that's literally is that 28,000 or 280,000 either way it's huge and that goes from really, really big, wow, 280,000, okay? 4,000, um, we're also looking at people who are in much smaller groups, organizational groups of 10 people or less, okay? I guess the point I'm talking about here is some of us are working in really, really big, complex organizations now, okay? Some of us don't even have to see each other anymore. OK, so in this new normal, in the day's working environment, we're not living with those people. We may not see them face to face on a day to day basis. We don't sit beside them or make small talk or have these micro opportunities to build stronger professional relationships with them. And also we're not as tight to them. So the great thing about working remotely or for people who can work hybrid now is they get other balance in their life, but it can really affect um, what's happening in work, and it can also have an impact on your inner source um, initiatives as well. So I just want to talk a little bit here about certain trends and challenges for inner source collaboration. And I know quite a few of you will be very aware of these already, but it's important to name them. OK, when you're working in a really, really, really large organization, OK, where you're not seeing people, um, on a regular basis where you don't have a lot of face-to-face -face, um, engagement and maybe you're working asynchronously, which we'll talk about asynchronous work in a minute because there's tons of benefits to that. But where there's very, what I would call shallow relationships with large numbers of people spread across all different types of teams, we tend to have lower emotional connections with those people. OK, when we have lower emotional ties or social ties to people, we tend to feel less accountable to them. So we take less personal responsibility for our actions. And what happens then? We tend to have poorer behavior because we know we can get away with it. OK, it's not going to matter too much if I'm really nasty to Bob on that Zoom call. I never see him anyway. I'm not going to have to face him in the canteen later on. And I only have to deal with them once or twice a year. OK, then there's another problem. OK, so 
we all know in inner source the benefits of asynchronous communication okay we have lots of patterns and lots of works being done on that and we've learned a lot from open source communities around this we have great systems in place but i guess there's one thing we need to kind of really name here humans are wired for face-to-face -face connection okay that's how we are wired to build relationships okay i'm just showing that picture there of that guy we have over 43 muscles in our face. We have 20 distinct expressions to show very specific emotions. And then there's a whole range of micro expressions that we can use from like moving one eyebrow to flaring an nostril to even moving our ears back a little that indicate how we're feeling to people. And how we often build trust with people is by mirroring them. We mirror them unconsciously. So if you're falling in love with someone, you'll often see people who are falling in love with the same facial expressions while they're talking to each other. Or you'll see it with teenagers a lot. A really great example is if you walk by a group of teenage girls one of them will start giggling and sc or screaming hysterically and it's like a ripple that goes across the whole group okay they're unconsciously mirroring each other and as they do that they're building a relationship a tighter more knit community as they do that okay when we don't have regular face-to-face -face communication with the people we work with when we're not aware of the tone of their voice when they're typing something, this can also make it harder and more challenging, especially for people who are new to asynchronous co communication, to build those lasting, trusting, professional um, relationships and to trust each other around cross-team collaboration. And, you know, it's really interesting now because there's been a load of articles. If you Google Zoom Boom, in cosmetic um in the cosmetic industry what you'll find is a lot of people have been getting you know botox fillers things like that because they want to look better on zoom now but a problem is arising people can't read their micro expressions okay so that's affecting how they're communicating with each other um and it's important to name that okay because when we are on zoom calls we really need to be able to um see the other person and understand those micro expressions and the facial expressions they're making. Okay, so I want to talk about the importance of building trust, okay? Where we have high levels of trust, we have higher, we have lower levels of conflict, okay? But trust takes time, okay? And I want to talk about some of the conflict before we start talking about the trust, okay? So when we're working virtually, or when we're working in cross-team collaboration, um, studies show there's three types of conflict, okay? The first type of conflict tends to be about what we're doing. So I'm not sure about the goals on this task. I don't sure, not sure the goals of this task match with what we're going to do. I don't like what we're doing. I don't think it's going to be successful. So that's when we have a conflict about what we're doing, okay? Then there's process conflict. OK, process conflict is about the how. OK, I don't think this is the best idea here. I think we should do something else instead. Also, I'm not happy with the roles. OK, why does that person have that role? Surely that person should be doing X instead. So it's all about how we're doing the task. OK, then we have relational conflict. So relational conflict isn't so much about roles. It's about you. OK, I don't like you. I don't like how you do things. This is personal. I don't trust you. OK, so when we're trying to make sure we're in high trust, low conflict environments, especially with people who we're not seeing every day, people who may be on really, really different teams, we want to build two types of trust. The first trust, the first phase of trust is called cognitive trust. OK. That's where we're, when we're in a professional setting, we're trying to where we want to demonstrate you can trust me. I am competent. I am able to do this job. We can work together. I have integrity. And if you fail, I will help you. OK, so cognitive trust is what we build in the beginning. It takes a long time to build and we need evidence. The more evidence we have from somebody, the more likely we are to start finally trusting them cognitively around the tasks, around the process, around the very pro professional side of the relationship. Then we have relational trust, okay? This is about building a proper 
interpersonal relationship. Okay, this takes much longer, much, much longer to build. But really, you need both aspects of this, of this, these two trusts to make a high trust, low conflict environment. Okay, so we also call relationship relational trust effective trust and it always comes after cognitive trust you're not going to get relational trust until you've built up a bank of cognitive trust and you've also been working on interpersonally connecting with that person okay this is what i love about inner source right so much work has already been done in the commons around creating a system or a structure that promotes cognitive trust, okay? So when we think about the learning path, I think about the videos around different roles, around the trusted committer, around the contributor, um, and all those types of things, because process-wise, we want to understand that everybody is a clearly defined role, that they understand the boundaries they're operating in, and that they're, um, and, and that they're very, very, very clear on who does what, okay? We also have books, okay? We have some books with some amazing work from some companies at a different uh, different parts of their um, inner source journeys. And they really talk about how they build relationships and that. There's a lot of work around um, certain tooling they used, um, different approaches they took on different projects, but there's also a lot of talk about getting buy-in, okay? And when you're getting buy-in, essentially one of the things you're doing is building relationships and then there's the patterns okay we have over 30 patterns and they are all about solving problems and creating ways to make our work our work together across teams more effective okay but they're also a number of them really good around lowering the risk of conflict so when i think of patterns like start as an experiment OK, or the 30 day warranty warranty. What they're doing is they're making a, a potential conflict a lower stake one. OK, they're saying we're going to make this as easy as possible for you to get involved in this. And in doing so, the stakes are going to be lowered. The risk is going to be lower for you. You're likely to have less conflict if this fails. All right. Another great um a great uh, pattern or some great patterns we have are around communication tooling, standard-based documentation. So that's all about the tasks you need to do to make sure that you can work together better. And we even have some great patterns around building trust, um, relational patterns like praise participants around genuinely celebrating and acknowledging people who are making this work happen. Okay, so now we're on to relational trust and cross-team collaborating. Um, I've already talked and named uh, the praise participants uh, pattern, which I'm a big fan of. I want to talk about some other work that I would use as a restorative practitioner to build relational trust, okay? So what we really, really need on cross-team collaboration is openness and transparency, okay? So what we need to understand, and we have the system set up from, a, from patterns in terms of standard-based documentation or how people communicate, is for everybody to feel that they're part of one unit, everyone gets information at the same time, and it's high quality information. I guess it's a way of saying there were no favorites here. We're all the same, we're all equal, and we're all trying to work, work well together. And then there's all the work around building community relationships, okay? So what I would say is work always needs to go, whatever kind of culture you're building or whatever kind of change you want to make is, it's always worth putting the time into understanding what our shared values are, okay? I like to think of values like a big block of Jenga. You know those Jenga blocks? When you start pulling away values like respect, trust, transparency, eventually it will fall. And by getting people involved at an early stage around what are the values and why are we doing this, you're going to actually deepen the bonds within that community because people will feel safer. I would also say, and the studies show, asynchronous working is amazing. We still need to build in face-to-face -face contact and social engagement, even if that's on Zoom, okay? I know people are working on cross-team collaboration with completely different people and completely different sides of the planet 
but there still needs to be that sense of people being able to see each other, make face-to-face contact, see each other react, and learn about each other's reactions through face-to-face engagement. Um, Celebrating members is really, really important, okay? Um, Anyone who chooses to get involved in an inner source initiative is making, uh, I guess, a choice to spend more time working and take on more workload. And that needs to be acknowledged and celebrated as widely as possible. And then there's this sense of trying to create psychological safety. So what you always want to do in any community you're building or working in is make, letting people know it's okay to fail. You're going to be safe. We're going to hold you, okay? And we're going to learn from this. And it's okay to be different too. We'll figure this out together. So really, any kind of community initiative you're building around inner source, you want it to be a community that evolves, but a community that people are very engaged in understanding the culture of. And this culture may be different even from your wider organization. And we'll talk about that in a minute, but it's really important that it's a positive culture where people feel connected, okay? Supporting everybody's voice is really important as well. So even if you're working asynchronously, you want people to feel that they can speak up and talk at any point. So what you're always trying to model, whether it's on face-to-face Zoom calls, or through quick check-ins online is that you want to hear what people's voice. Everybody has a voice and everybody should be listened to, okay? So I modeled this earlier by asking you guys a number of questions and asking you to complete them in a Zoom chat. When I work with a group or a team or an organization, we have a check-in to see how people are doing emotionally in the beginning, check out to see how they're doing, but we use words like energy levels or we ask them to pick a color or we ask them to give us two words to describe how their day has gone. It's showing that you're taking the emotional temperature of the group. It's really quick. And actually people feel quite quite comfortable when people ask them that. They feel like, oh, I matter. What we do then is we build that in and we start asking more questions with higher stakes as we go and we get to know people better. So for instance, I didn't ask you guys, when was the last time you were in a conflict? I asked you, when was the last time you saw a conflict? Okay, I don't know you well enough to ask you that. So we build up the stakes slowly as we get to know people. And then we start asking questions that give people a chance to reveal more of themselves. All right. Um, I would also say you need periodic check-ins with teams. Okay, they don't have to be every week or every day. You need those check ins. And when you're having those check ins with people, hopefully face to face on Zoom or other in other ways, you always want to be using them as opportunities to build personal connections between the groups. So there's the questions you can ask. You can ask one silly icebreaker per meeting. It takes two minutes and it always acts like a social lubricant. People just let their guards down a bit. And you also always want to be building people's confidence while you do it. Okay, I'm going to move on now to resistance. Okay, so resistance is about that tension we feel when there's been signaling for change. And many people in the commons will, you know, refer to at times different types of resistance or or blockers that they faced um, when they've been going through um, uh, you know, or trying to develop or scale up an inner source initiative. So first of all, I just want to apologize. That is the worst Venn diagram ever. I couldn't do a proper one earlier, but I hope you understand uh, it enough to understand it is a Venn diagram. So I just wanted to talk about the system and the culture we're in. When you're in an inner source environment and you're working in a larger organization, okay? Every organization has its stated values, okay? They'll have a mission statement, an annual report, and the values are very important to that organization. Don't get me wrong. Their values are there for a reason. Every organization also has a number of objectives and actions and things they need to do to keep going, to sustain itself, or to make a profit, okay? Your culture or your system is where those values and those actions align, okay? So sometimes there are hidden values in a system that maybe even the the, the key decision makers aren't so aware of, or the system's been set up in a certain way, which means that there's certain values that are lower down the pecking order than others. So for instance, if you are in an organization 
that um, cultivates promotion pathways for people who do a lot of uh, cross-team collaboration. That value will be more part of the system than if you're an organization that says you want more cross-team collaboration, you want more innovation, but you're not doing anything specific. There are no concrete actions to reward or incentivize people, okay? Sometimes when people talk about blockers, they talk to certain about certain decision makers in an organization. They may not be the most senior leadership. They may be slightly lower than that, or some people might say they're middle, middle management. Um, and they talk about that group or that cohort as being a blocker. I would say they're not a blocker. I would say the system they're in is blocking them, okay? Um, when you're mediating, you're always trying to build empathy between two different parties. And you do that by asking questions so you can understand the situation better. And what I would ask is if you meet somebody who is not fully supportive of the change you're trying to make, well, first of all, change makes us scared change creates stress it affects our window of tolerance so it's natural actually for quite a lot of people not to feel like they would want to support change okay so that's number one number two it's really important to think about that person and what the issues are for them okay you already know inner source is great and that your company will be a better company as a result of it but what is the role of that manager or that decision maker in your organization is it their role to innovate or is it their role to get their team over the line at a certain point in the year every year okay what are their deadlines what are the pressure points on them and what will happen to them if they get involved in an inner source initiative and it fails okay I'm talking about the high stakes element there. Are they in a really, really competitive environment? If they're in a competitive high stakes environment, that's a huge risk for them to suddenly say, listen, let's allocate 10% of our staff time to working on inner source projects. What will happen if their team gets involved and then their team misses targets? And who's going to support them and champion them to take on inner source? Because we all need people to provide us with the support to make culture change. So I'm not saying there aren't people who just might be a little bit like stick in the muds, don't really like change, aren't bothered, but often there's really, really good reasons and they have needs that aren't going to be met by inner source. So how do you understand what those needs are so you can show them and talk to them about how you might be able to meet those needs? Okay, so I am going to talk to you about a mediator's approach to culture change, okay? What I'd like to say is, I hear all the time that people say, inner source takes time. Inner source culture change takes time and often that their organization didn't realize it would take that long. Um, what I would also like to say is, if you're working in inner source, cognitive and relational trust takes time. So if you're working with key decision makers who aren't proactively supporting you, chances are you may have proved and created cognitive and relational trust with other people or with a, a group of developers who can now see the benefits to the work, work to their work. You probably need still to still invest cognitive and uh, still invest time in building that cognitive and relational trust with that decision maker. Okay. How do we do that? We do that by taking an approach of deep listening. So any mediator will tell you their superpower is really simple. They're just great at listening. And when you hear something that I guess represents an obstacle in a conversation with somebody who you find difficult, who you feel is blocking, I would say, of course, you can take a route where you start having an intellectual discussion with them about um, the benefits of inner source. But what I would be more inclined to do as a mediator when I hear somebody place an obstacle in front of me is to use the acronym WAIT, okay? So WAIT means why am I talking? When somebody is talking to you about an obstacle, you don't have to present them with a solution straight away. 
it's much better if you can listen deeply and ask them open-ended questions to really understand what are their needs? What are the risks and the stakes involved from them? What are they worried about? Okay, what are their values? What will come down to bear on them in terms of the people who manage them? Okay, and that will also give you a better idea of the system that they're operating in and the pressures on them. The other thing I always use is the rule of five. So if you become yourself and you're feeling yourself that your window of tolerance is shrinking in a conversation, I would always say, does your response have to happen in the next five seconds? Do you need to come back with a response in the next five minutes? Do you need to answer that retort in the next five hours? Do you have to answer this response in the next five days? Can this wait five weeks? So if you hear of an obstacle or a blocker that's really, really affecting you, I would always say timing is everything. Wait as long as you can before you try and provide a response to that or a solution to that. Give yourself time to go back into your window of tolerance and feel like you can regulate. Another thing we make a mistake when we're evangelists is about the co communication we use with the person who may be presenting the obstacle to us, okay? I would ask you while you're waiting, while you're not talking, to really think about what the language that person is using, okay? We tend to use three different types of language depending on the kind of person we are. We use head language, so that's all about understanding the meaning of something, what you're thinking, what the facts are. Others among us use heart language. Oh, I'm not getting a good feeling about this. I don't know if this is a good idea. Or we use hand language. Hand represents action. OK, so when this person is talking to you about what the obstacles are, what kind of language are they using? If they're speaking around facts, statistics and the bottom line, um, they're taking their meaning and they're having a very um, head approach. They're using rational statistics and facts to guide them around their decision making. If they're telling you their instincts, they just don't like it. There's something going on with their feelings there that you need to address. And it's probably their need to feel safer around this, their need for the risks to be reduced or to have more guarantees that they will be safe and the people they work with will, will be safe around this. If they're talking about activity, that means they're very, very action focused and you need to think and talk in a way that matches that. If somebody's talking to you about actions and you're talking to them about feelings, you're literally speaking to them in two different languages. So it's really important to use that deep listening approach to understand what where their priorities are. OK, the next thing is, are you meeting their needs? So inner source projects often start out with a very specific need that can be addressed through a pilot project. OK, or through people working together to see if there's a way they can break down some kind of silo, OK, or a bottleneck. Um, as we scale up, it's really important to keep staying focused on stakeholders needs. If somebody who's a decision maker doesn't see how inner source is meeting their needs, it's much harder to convince them or to really engage with them about why they should be doing it. I would also talk about keeping the relationship alive, okay? It's important to keep checking in with people, even if it's for 10 minutes. It's important to ask them how they're doing. It's important to show that they can have a really, really, really difficult conversation with you. And that's okay. It's not going to lead to a really, really dysfunctional conflict, okay? You're there to listen. You're there to understand and that you may come back at some point with a solution, but it can be a very healthy conversation where people air their differences. Another thing I'd like to say is uh, one of my favorite quotes comes from Maya Angelou. And the quote is this, people won't always remember what you said. They won't really remember what you did, but they'll always remember how you made them feel. And that's really what relational trust is about. So I have lots of references here. Feel free to get in touch if you want to know about any of them. 
And I also just want to say, like, I'm a really big fan of this community. I love learning more. And if you ever have, you know, a difficult conversation that you want to kind of talk through or you're facing a conflict and you just need another perspective, just give me a shout. Send me an email. This community has been really good to me. So I, I just want to be there for you guys too. drop me a line anytime and we'll have a little chat about it. So thanks a million.